Hey everybody, so I've got such a cool video for you because this is by far the nicest restoration of a Volkswagen I have ever seen. It's such a cool vehicle with a bunch of really cool components, but the guy who did it is even cooler, Joe. <laughs> Thanks for coming in again, Tommy, dude. appreciate the invite. So Joe has had a ton of these cars. He's a real expert. And in this video, we're not only gonna tell you about his car, but also some of the things to look out for when buying a Volkswagen, uh, early versus late ones, and which one you should buy. So this is not your first Volkswagen, clearly. It's not, no. I've, I've built uh, quite a few Volkswagen Bugs uh, in my time. This is probably the, uh, the, the most time I've spent building one uh, <laughs> and, and the most effort I put into building one, yeah. You guys have been asking for more Subaru content. Well, we have it over at TFL Classics with our latest project series, this Subaru Forester. And if you want this very Forester, it's for sale over at our new auction site, tflbids.com, a great place to buy and sell an unusual car, truck, or SUV. So check it out, tflbids.com. So let's talk about the car. What year is it and how did you find it? So it's a 1956 oval window ragtop. I've known of, the, of its existence since the early 90s. It was a friend of mine. His his uh, his mom and dad got it from his grandpa when they got married in California. They drove this thing out to start their family. Wow! In uh, the you know early 70s, and uh, I had been trying to buy this VW since probably 1990. And Pearl, uh, the lady that owned it, wouldn't sell it. She would not part from it because it's been in their family. So finally, about uh, 10 years ago, she kind of gave the car up to Toby, her son and he was gonna do some stuff to it, never really got around to it, and, and uh, asked me if I wanted the opportunity to buy it from him. So when you bought it, it did not look anything like this, and we'll include those pictures here, but what was the condition like? So the condition from, I guess, fr from you know a, a 30 foot view, it, was, it looked really nice, um, but getting up close to it, it just had a lot of the wrong parts in it. Um, just Volkswagens, I think that, you know, it's the people's car, so, um, you know, people drove them, they abused them, they beat them up, and then parts were relatively interchangeable, so the wrong parts got installed on a lot of VWs. Hmm. Um, and in this case, when I got it, it had a lot of the wrong parts, and it was primered when I got it, but, um, and it looked good, but the, the, the idea and the vision I had, I needed to take it down to bare metal. So when you start a project like this, where do you start? Do you start with the body? Do you start with the pan, the, the, basically the underside? Do you start with the engine? How does that process start? I started with the engine. Um, that was the first thing we did was pulled the motor out of it. And well, let's check that out. So what, what did it originally have in it? So originally this would have come with an 1100 cc motor. Um, when I got it, it had a, it had a 12 volt, uh, like a 1776 motor in it. And we pulled that, that's the first thing we started with was we pulled that motor out and I knew it was gonna go into the body shop so I had everything lined up. Um, and the apron on this car at the time, which, which basically is this piece here, um, it had the wrong apron in it. So at some point the car was probably wrecked or rear-ended. Okay. And then they put an aftermarket apron in. I, I wanted to pay as much homage back to the VWs as possible so I sought out um, you know, the right apron for it. So in the world of Volkswagens, you've got everything from like a thousand cc's all the way to over two liters. Um, what's kind of the advantage of going smaller versus bigger? Obviously probably more power. More power, yeah. I mean, this is a 2387 cc motor. So it's a two liter motor. Um, the advantages of it are it's, you know, they are still full metal heavy cars. They, I think they only weigh 1600 pounds. Um, so to, to kind of keep up with today's modern car, you kind of have to go with a, a a bigger displacement CC motor. Interesting. Now with an engine like this, can you do highway speeds pretty easily? And I can. So yeah. so this motor, when we had it built, it would be no different. So it's a stroker motor. It's it's a, I mean, probably quarter mile car. It, it maybe you do, you know, 13s in the quarter no. mile. Yeah. And a Volkswagen? Yeah. 13s yeah. in the quarter? Yeah, it'd probably do, you know, high to, to, to <laughs> mid 13s. Unreal. Yeah, but but I didn't I didn't have the transmission built that way. Okay. So I had it built with 388 gears. They call it a highway gear. Um, so running down the highway at about 80 miles an hour, I'm I'm hitting about 1100 RPMs. So what do you think the horsepower is on this unit? It was dynoed at 200 uh, at the crank. 200. Yeah. Yep. And then up here, I haven't dynoed it since it's been put in the car, but um, 
I'm estimating it's probably about 170, 175 horse to the ground. And originally it had 40? Yeah, I think 36, yeah, 36 or 40, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah. you, you did the engine first, and then talk to me um, about how the body came together. So once we, once we got on the schedule with my body guy, I knew it was something that I couldn't do, was the body work. You know, like I said, a lot of this stuff is you bolt it on, bolt fenders on, and, and but I, I wanted my body guy to take his time and take it down and make it as pure as possible. Wow. So all the fenders were replaced, both aprons were replaced, um, the deck lid was replaced, took it down to bare metal, and then um, he just kind of went to work from there. And we put it on a 69 pan, which is an IRS pan, so f way different from the swing axle pan. Can you explain that? Yeah, so basically the transmission has a CV joint that comes out, and then it's an axle straight to the hub. So that would be the swing axle. On an IRS pan, there are two CV joints, one at the transmission, one at the axle. So it keeps the wheels kind of more stand up instead of getting a bunch of camber in them when you either lift them or, or lower them. Um, I, I, wanted, I didn't want any camber in the wheel, so I wanted to keep them you know, kind of as straight up as possible and, and keep it looking as factory as possible, even though it was lowered. So you, the fenders are um, new to this car. Um, the, the pan is new to this car. What is original to the car? Is there anything that came from the 56? The, so original, um, I mean, the, the, the rag top is definitely original. The hardware is original in it. Um, and then probably the body shell, right? It's gotta be. Yeah, original, yeah, the, yeah. The, the body itself is all original. Um, wow. there, there, was, there was nothing, nothing wrong with the body. Um, doors are original, quarter panels are original, and the hood is original. So, <laughs> I think one of kind of the misconceptions, and I'm starting to figure this out with my very brief experience with Volkswagens, is that parts are super easy to get. And that's true for a lot of cars, but it sounds like from talking to you that the older you go, it kind of becomes a scavenger hunt. So was it difficult to track down all the bits for this car? It was. Yeah. Um, you know, I could have definitely put aftermarket parts on it that were cheaper and kind of more readily available. Um, but there's a company out of California called Wolfsburg West and those guys are probably the, the, the best aftermarket metal um, company around if you have to replace body panels or even even some interior stuff. They have a lot of interior stuff, wing windows. The, these were all Wolfsburg West. Wow. Um, they, they just do a nicer quality. When you get down to the smaller stuff, like trying to find the hardware for the rag top or trying to find the, the gas tank or the, the gas cap, those things, get really difficult to find um, headlights. Stuff like gas caps are, yeah. are difficult to find, really? Yeah, yeah, so I could show you this one. Yeah, let's see it. 56 was a little bit different. Um, they From 56 to 57, 57 was the last of the oval window. And can you explain, like, if no one has no name about Volkswagen, what does the oval window mean? So oval window is the rear window. The rear window is an oval shape and 57 was the last of the oval shaped rear window. So they started to kind of migrate to, um, you know, whatever they had manufactured, they were starting to make their new body style. So some 56s came with a different, a different style tank. So early tanks came with, I don't remember what they're called, but it's kind of looks like a peanut shape. And then the later ones had a big, a big pan. So this one, this one, I, I was able to find uh, the later of the, of the earlier ones. Wow, look at that. That's but crazy. We're still, we're still, I'm still fighting some gremlins on the electrical part, but this was super hard to find. Um, it is a remanufactured one, so as soon as it was available, I bought it. This, on the other hand, took me months to track down, and I had to find it um, basically off the Samba, and they, they just, they just don't exist. Wow, that's they're, incredible. They're non-existent. And that's what this would have looked like from the factory. Yeah, yeah. Unreal. I love that. There's a couple like little Volkswagen um, tidbits, which I think are really cool. So that's certainly one of them. Like also the key. Yeah. We get a shot of that has like the little VW on it. Yeah, I had to search that out as well. So that's an original early 56, 57 um, key and ignition. So those were things that I, that, you know, the only way to find those was just, just searching for them. And the Samba, um, which, I don't know if you know about the Samba, but it's a website, and that's where a lot of VWs uh, go to, to find, you can find a lot of original Interesting. stuff from the Samba, yeah. And that's where I was able to find the key and the gas cap. So let's talk about these wheels and brake package, because I think this is really cool. What's the story here? 
So I converted them all over to the Porsche bolt pattern. Um, those are those are impies. They they replicate the Fuchs, the Porsche Fuchs. Um, so they're five on one thirty, and then I did a, a disc brake Willwood conversion kit to it. Oh, um, nice. Since I was going to get inside of there, I thought you know what I might as well just do the whole thing. Um, usually when you go to a disc brake, I had to I had to narrow the beam by two inches because I lowered the car. So I narrowed the beam by two inches and then I used drop spindles um, to get the car even a little bit lower. And basically the two inches that I narrowed the beam is gonna take up for the disc space. Oh, interesting. And and then just to get the wheels kind of tucked into the fenders a little bit so you're not rubbing fenders. Very cool. Wow, what an interesting thing. Um, now, I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about like uh, the time involved in this because this was clearly a labor of love. How long did this take from start to, to where we're at now? S start to finish, it was 18 months. Um, and what's the longest process? Is it the engine, the body work, the paint? All of it, really, <laughs> yeah. You know, all of it. It, it, was, it was all just a labor of love. I was able to work with a bunch of professional people. Um, John May was my body work guy. Uh, so fine did my interior painters grinding helped me with getting miscellaneous parts all of those people together was able to get me on a time frame where I started out January 1 of 20, uh, 2020 and you know we put a schedule together and with the help of all of those people we were able to meet that schedule for for bug in just this last yeah. July so we made it two days before bug in nice yeah freaking cool absolutely amazing yeah so everybody was really professional like i said john may was he stuck to his schedule uh once once that was done and i got it back to my house then i started working on the suspension and kind of waiting for carol at so fine and mike to to get me my date and uh i rolled it into their shop and and they kicked it back out to me uh, on their expected date and so and speaking of interior let, let's talk about that for, for a little bit now um one thing i didn't realize is that that hole in the dash where the speaker cover is is original it is original yeah so originally they would have come with that's where the speaker would have would have been placed and then below that the flat spot is where you would have seen the stereo uh -huh. um early 56s it wouldn't have been flat like that it would have had a speaker plate or a stereo plate plate cover um this vehicle particular because it was just so old you know as, at some point in the 80s people put pull, alpine pull outs in them and, <laughs> and whatever but it was pretty hammered up and so we ended up cutting that section out and then re refacing it and what's the story with the steering wheel so that's a banjo steering wheel those are early those are those are kind of predominantly to the earlier cars um that one i just i was able to find it it's a it's a repop it's not an original one um the original ones would be extremely expensive really yeah and that one was still pretty expensive Unfortunately, this car is a 56 and it has a 65 steering column in it because I was not able to find a 56 steering column. Hmm. So I'm, I'm working with a, uh, a little bit later column in this thing. However, at Bug In a few weeks ago, I was able to find a 56 steering column. Oh, sweet. So that's gonna be next on the list is this winter, I'm gonna pull that out and put the original steering column back in it. Or did, a, a original steering column. Did it come with a car or were you able to get you the steering no, column? No, actually the guy, I was really surprised. The guy had the car there and he was parting it out. Oh, wow. I'm not, we talked to him and I'm like, hey, why are you doing this? I like, keep the car together, but he, you know, he was selling all the parts, the rag top, he was selling the rag top, he was selling the, the steering column, the turn signal switch. I mean, he was just parting the whole car out. Weird. So yeah, yeah. That's pretty crazy. To my benefit. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, it was sad to see that happen to that car. Cause I think together, if you would have kept it together, it would have been worth, it would just been more valuable. Yeah. So speaking of that, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about if, if someone's watching this and wants to get into the world of Volkswagens, I think a common misconception, and I've had this too, is like they were the same from the late 30s to the 1970s. But as we're learning, not only were the different decades different, but year to year there were a lot of changes. Yeah. yeah. So what are the most desirable years and when, what are going to be the least desirable years? So I think the earlier cars are going to be the most desirable. Um, and that could be as early as, you know, 65. It, it all depends. Everybody likes a different different style. Split windows um, are really desirable. So Is that, that like was older than 56? That would have been like 54. Oh, wow. So okay. yeah, so 55, they started coming out with the oval window. So it basically had just the bar in the window, mm. pre-55. Um, so those cars are really super rare. And then as you go up through the, through the, through the years, they, get, they become less rare. But I think they're all desirable cars. 
Um, you know, Volkswagen, the, the bug especially was known as the people's car. Uh, people drove them. They drove them in the winter. I drove mine in the winter. You know, Did you? I, yeah, yeah, I have. I, I can relate to people talking about you know using an ice scraper inside the car to, <laughs> to, you know, when I was trying to get to school. So the heaters didn't work very well in them. But they're. I think they're all desirable cars. All years of them are. Um, they do seem like they are interchangeable. I think the technology is the same throughout the years, but they did make different, um, you know, fenders are different, running boards are different, doors are different, but you can get parts to fit, and that's what people did, is get the wrong parts to fit to get going. And then, of course, a lot of it's going to come down to budget as well. So a 56 is going to be a lot more expensive than a 76. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, just, just body for body, yeah, it's going to be more expensive. Um, and especially, like I said, as the, as the earlier cars, they are more rare. Yeah. So obviously this is an exception, but what does a typical, like good 56 go for? What do you see them online for? Um, I haven't really seen like a complete 56 on the market. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think we saw one a, a few weeks ago on Barrett Jackson. Um, I think it was a black 56, but it was stock, you know? Sure. So, so either somebody did a fantastic re restoration on it. Um, or maybe it was just kept in the garage, but but I want to say that one went for like eighty thousand. Wow! Wow! Uh, for a Volkswagen. Yeah. Unreal. So you know, and of course, the buses are even more expensive. Right. But, but I think um, you know I got this insured through Haggerty, and you know they valued it. They put the insurance value at sixty thousand on it. Yeah. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. So would you do this again? Would you go through this process even even all the months later and all the the resources and time? You know, I don't think I'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it was difficult or I just, it, it was really tough finding the right parts. So you was know? that the hardest part you think? It, it was, wow. yeah. Yeah, finding the, you know, the deck lid is next to impossible to find. That's a W deck lid. Um, I was fortunate enough to find a convertible deck lid because um, the displacement is so big. That worked great. But, you know, it, it does become, when you're trying to build something like this and you're on a schedule, do I have the right parts? And then you, you forget about one little thing um, and then you go put the stuff together and then all of a sudden you're like, I don't have the bumpers. You know, <laughs> just stuff like that, that, that you just don't think about during the process and you get it done and there's just one thing missing. And there's always gonna be one thing missing on this thing. I mean, it's, it's, never, it's a never ending love. Now, speaking um, of parts, we talked about this a little earlier off camera. One thing I didn't realize is, I um, mean, I know you, you had the big focus on OEM parts, but even stuff like glass is gonna be different if you buy it today versus from what came on the car. Yeah, so the glass, today's, today's glass is made with quarter inch glass and earlier bugs, it was uh, 3 16 glass. Wow. So I think I got that right. So um, the thicker glass is kind of the standard glass and they don't manufacture thin glass anymore. Sure. So it, you have to find somebody who either has uh, old stock um, that's good, or there is a company out of Britain, which that's where I got the, the door window from, the door glass. You know, when I, I had just happened to look and they had four pieces of glass and I bought two of them and then a friend of mine bought the other two. Wow. And they still, to this day, don't have new glass back. So Unreal. I'm not sure if it's just a shortage, uh, a timing thing, or if it, it's just a production thing and they're just not gonna make them anymore. Crazy, crazy. Well guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Huge thank you to Joe for bringing the coolest Volkswagen guy I've ever seen in person. Thanks dude, this is so Tommy, much fun. Tommy, I appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next episode.